children can be distracted, forget their homework, get fidgety or tune out from time to time. But how would you know or how do you know when inattention and hyperactivity is a sign that something more is going on? Attention Deficit Hyperactive Disorder, or ADHD, is one of the most common behavioural disorders in children. And to find out more about it, we are joined now by Actualized Clinic Director and ADHD expert, Dr. Michael Keane, and Aoife Griffin, whose son, Evan, was only three when he was diagnosed with ADHD. You're both very welcome. Aoife, tell me about Evan. When did you go, do you know, something's amiss here? Well, Evan was our first child. I'm from a house of girls. He was our first boy. So it took a little while to realise that, okay, this isn't quite normal for boys. And it was really play school and then junior infants was when we really started to notice he was very... It was with his peers. He was socially inept. He wasn't able to communicate the way that other kids at the same age were. He was very impulsive, very excitable. Um, and then when he got into second or junior infants, it really became noticeable. You know, the whole sitting down, having to sit down and focus on things that he wasn't interested in really highlighted it. Um, we got called in to see his primary school teacher and she sat down with myself and husband and went, this isn't a bull child. This is not somebody who is deliberately acting up or deliberately not able to sit down or do the work. He wants to do it. He just can't. And were you relieved when you had that conversation? You were like, oh, okay, there is something up here. You know, I mean, yeah. your gut must have told you all was not right. There is. And you're sitting there and you're going, you can deny a lot when you yeah. want to. For, for a certain period, you can go, oh God, maybe it's this or maybe yeah. it's that. And then when someone actually says, okay, no, we acted. We went through the assessment of need process. We didn't want to wait. So we yeah. also got a private diagnosis. The private diagnosis came through very quick of ADHD, what they called PDD NOS traits, which is autism. And they also sort of said opposition defiance disorder. Now that was through the private system and that got us the help for school. That got him his resources. It got him his SNA. It got us an answer. So we could start behind the scenes working on things. The public sector took four years to get to the same diagnosis. It was four years later when CAMS came back and said it was ADHD and autism. If you couldn't have afforded to go private, mm. what do you think would have happened? Oh, we would have lost more time. We, as it was... And Evan might have been characterised as, as a... As a bold child. Yeah. And he would never had an SNA. He would never had the support he didn't get. He would never have had the understanding. Because labels... Time he was seven or eight, he would have had a reputation. Exactly, exactly. And labels don't change your child. They don't give you an, you know, they don't suddenly say, okay, Evan's autistic, so that means this, so that means that, or he has ADHD, so now it explains. It literally gets you a doorway to help. It tells you where you need to go to support your child. Your child is still lovely, he's still funny, he's still happy and witty, and it doesn't change the child, but it gives you a way to help him and support his needs in a different way. What was the first protocol? Was it medication that was first prescribed? When CAMS finally diagnosed us, it was. That was their route, was instant medication. Before that, we had tried psychological interventions, mm -hmm. occupational therapy. We had tried several different private routes. Um, and then as soon as Cam said, right, you have your, la your label now, meds is the first answer. And were you, was that a last resort for you? Yes, I had always yeah. been like, I'm never trying medication. I'm not doing mm -hmm. it. I don't want to medicate my child. He was only seven and eight at that time. And you're thinking, I can't put him on medication. And at the time, he is also diagnosed with epilepsy. I was already on medication for that. So you're thinking, how many things are going to play with your brain? Yeah. Are you going to put and in your, your child's body? And your liver. Exactly. And what were the side effects like then for the medication? The side effects Evan? for Evan, for the ADHD, it was horrific. He stopped eating. He stopped sleeping. It's brought down all his ADHD behaviours. He was no longer impulsive. He was able to focus on a task. He was able to sit in a desk in school from 10 to 9 till half 2. So the school thought this was the answer. But it was but like his spirit was gone. You lost Evan. You lost his personality. You lost all the things that made him him, for want of a better word. That's and what a choice to have to make as a parent. Yeah. And it was horrific. But the other side of it was, like we, Evan, we were always very open with Evan from the beginning. So he had a say in all the treatments that we chose, including the medication. And he said, when he first tried the meds, he was like, Mama, it's great to feel calm. I've never felt calm before. And you're going, oh God, this is breaking my heart. Yeah. So we lasted longer and tried more meds because he liked the feeling of calm. But to me, I would have stopped it about a year because you could see your child disappear. He went down to skin and bone. He lost every bit of weight. He had no energy. It was just... Horrific. All right, to listen, watch your don't, don't upset yourself. No, I can see where you're thing. going. No, no, just, just, just take a little break there for a second. Um, Michael, this is one of those terms that we read all the time. We hear it said, and we, we kind of, oh, yeah, I know what that is. But I don't think the vast majority of us mm. have a bog's notion of what it is. So give us the, give us the science. What is ADHD? Um, 
generally characterized by three main sets of symptoms. They're inattention, impulsivity, and hyperactivity, and, and they kind of go together. And when children are young, you could say they're just a bit boisterous or, you know, sometimes people say they're a little bit bold. But it's only when you start reaching the school age that you begin to see that something's not exactly right. Um, it can start when you uh, when a child is challenged to organise themselves, for example. So the, the typical scenario that we hear about uh, at Actualize is the morning routine starts to become a problem. Getting your school bag ready, getting your lunch ready. Um, a parent once told me about having a child put their socks and shoes on, that that was four jobs for their son. It was one sock, the other sock, the other shoe, the other shoe. And what happens in the morning then is you send somebody upstairs to put their shoes on. Ten minutes later, they're not back down. There's one sock on, but they're playing with their Lego. And then the shouting match starts and everybody's late and you're a bit stressed out by the time you get to school. And then you have the problem sitting down at school and you have a problem with paying attention because there's distractibility. And then you have problems with impulse control. So if you have children lining up, for example, to play a game, a child with ADHD will struggle to hold back the impulse to play and they'll jump forward. And of course, all these things become circular then because in the morning, everybody's on edge mm. because you're saying, how are we going to get out on time? In school, other children are saying, well, I don't want to play with him because, you know, he can't take his turn. Mm. And next thing, the self-esteem begins to suffer a little bit. Then impulsivity begins to manifest in emotional regulation problems. So children can get angry or they can get really upset. Yeah. They lash out. And then the circularity kick cuts, in, uh, cuts in again because... They start being shunned and isolated. They do, and they're impulsive, and they can't hold it in, and then they feel embarrassed afterwards, so they get really hard on themselves, saying, I'm really sorry, I don't know why I did that, and then they get really self-critical. Um, do, we, do we know what the cause is? I mean, it's, it's neurodevelopmental in, in that it's the way your brain is developing as you're, uh, um, uh, as you're growing up. It has a certain genetic component, but... The manifestations of it are, in terms of behavior, are very, very consistent generally. But when we look at, for example, at Actualize, where we do our 3D functional brain imaging, the same symptoms across 10 people can manifest themselves as 10 very different looking brains. And the difficulty with that, of course, is the intervention for those 10 brains has to, to be, be tailor-made. And yeah, has to be very, very different. When did you meet Dr. Michael and tell us about the treatment he was able to provide for Evan? Evan was 11 turning 12, so it's two years ago. Um, like that, We had tried so many different things and we had stopped the medication at this stage. And I came across an article about it and Evan has epilepsy. So we knew about ECGs and what they do. And Evan had tried the hats on and had all the tests done before. So it wasn't anything scary. And I spoke to our neurologist and I said, listen, have you seen this study? And what have you, have you heard anything about it? And he said, look, I don't know enough about it to say it'll definitely work, but I know it won't do you any harm. So I went, well, that's enough for me to try. Because mm -hmm. we've tried everything else, so let's give it a go. And we went down on a Saturday morning and we met Michael. And Evan, you walk in and you're told, okay, today you're going to control a computer with your brain. And what 11-year-old boy doesn't want to control a computer game with his yeah. brain? So he's sitting there and he has a hat on and he's doing all the things so they can map his brain. And then you met Rose as a psychologist and she runs through kind of all the same questions that you get asked a hundred times. And then... We met Michael and he brought up Evan's brain map on the screen. And with that, Evan was hooked. He was in and we hadn't even left the building. And he went, when can I start? Mm -hmm. You know, when can we go back? And then I think by that night I had sent an email going, yes, how, how do we go about starting? And he started the following week. And for the next 10 weeks then, he was there twice a week doing his computer games. He thought he was there having a great old time. It's less than an hour. You're sitting there with the hat on. You're playing different games. As it, the weeks go on, the games change and your brain is obviously testing in different ways. I don't know any of the science behind it. I was just sitting there reading my book, watching him being happy. Mm. It's the most fun therapy I think he's ever tried. And what I loved really was his empathy levels have shot up. And that he, you know, you got a call from the school saying there's been an incident in PE. You thought Evan might have been at the root of it, but actually he was comforting a child who was being bullied, saying, I've been there, I've been bullied too, I know exactly how you're feeling. You must have been. I pieces. cried when yeah. I got that call. Because that's, as soon as you hear an incident, your stomach goes. As soon as yeah. you see the number of the school coming up, you've had so many bad calls, you're like, oh my goodness, what now? But he came home and he was like, I know, well, it was 
I can't even remember the child's name, but I, he was he was so upset, ma'am. But I knew how that felt. I had been bullied. I had been picked on. I know how horrible that is. And he went for a walk with his child and he calmed him down and they're now friends. And it's a lovely it is, side yeah, effect. No, yeah, no, it no. is. Uh, listen, this is an enormously complex area yeah. and, and each individual case is different and it requires bespoke and tailor-made treatment and we don't have enough time to deal with no. this here. Uh, M- Michael, there are people watching us right now saying, that's my child, what do I do? Is there, a, is there a website? Is there some place they can go to get more information? And Yeah, I mean, then people generally start as a GP or they'll they'll go to um, some mental health professionals. We, um, uh, on our website, actualize.ie, we um, can give people a free phone consultation because people just want information. So people can book it there. Uh, or actually next Thursday, we're going to do a Facebook Live um, from our Facebook page. Okay. At seven thirty. Um, so, how Thursday. would they get? How, how would people tune into that? What they is it just just find us on on Facebook. Actualize Ireland. Ireland. Yeah. Okay. Michael, thank, thank you so much. Uh, coming up next.